Welcome to Long Covid Doctor, an educational series for sufferers of Long Covid. I'm Dr Tim Robinson, formerly a GP for 30 years, now GP lead for three NHS Long Covid clinics and a NHS England clinical lead in Long Covid across the southwest of England. This episode is on pain and Long Covid. In the first part, I talk about the symptoms, the diagnosis, investigations and causes. And in part two, two I will talk about the treatments, uh, the management and the outcomes. References, links and resources are in the show notes below. Any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own GP or qualified health professional. So here we go, pain and long COVID. Firstly, the context, the background. Pain in long COVID is common. Pain occurring in so many different forms and areas, in my experience, in the three long COVID clinics I work in, uh, is extremely common. And it has great impact on our patients. This may be worsening of previous painful conditions that the patient may already have been suffering from, or a completely new pain, never had it before, for no reason other than the fact that they now have long COVID. So what are our patients experiencing? Um, The symptoms and the associated symptoms. There are so many presentations of pain in our patients with long COVID. There's headache and migraine, probably the commonest. There's chest pain, joint pain, muscle pain, nerve pain, abdominal pain. Uh, Abdominal pain, according to a recent paper in the show notes. Have a look at the, have a look at that reference. And now, for a little bit more about each in turn and their symptoms. So I started with headache and migraine, didn't I? Maybe the patient has never had headaches or migraines in the past, or maybe it's a worsening of their previous headaches or their previous migraines. The headache may be unilateral or bilateral, one-sided or, or both sides. It may be worse with light or noise, It may be associated with nausea or maybe a past history of, um, of, uh, migraine itself or, as I say, a family history of migraine. And then there's chest pain. What are the symptoms? What are the characteristics? Usually they're central or one-sided, could be either. Um, the pains may be either crushing or squeezing or sharp. The pains may be worse with movement or or direct pressure over the painful spot. The pain may be occurring at rest or only on exertion. It may be worse with deep inspiration. Maybe with other symptoms like breathlessness and cough. Chest pains. And then on to joint pains. Well, it may be just affecting one joint or a number of joints. Uh, the joints affected may be symmetrical, i.e. both knees, both ankles, both wrists, or the pains may be scattered here, there and everywhere, completely randomly, unconnected. There may be associated swelling or redness. And then there's muscle pain, obviously, you know, related to joint pains, but maybe um, standalone, maybe on its own without any joint pains. Those pains may be localised in one specific single area or generalised, general overall pain. The muscles may be tender. Patients often describe this. Maybe the pain in muscles is worse with exertion and associated with fatigue. And then on to nerve pain, neuralgia. That can, again, happen anywhere in the body. Typically, it's sort of on the limbs, the upper limbs, lower limbs. Again, could be symmetrical or could be scattered here, there, showing no sort of pattern. It may be a 
occurring sort of only in the face, the only place. That could be something called trigeminal neuralgia. And then finally, abdominal pains. Maybe they are sort of, you know, colicky in nature, on and off, intermittent, or maybe constant. Maybe with other abdominal symptoms such as bloating, distension. Maybe there's there's associated variable bowel habit. So, all those symptoms of all those different types of pain need to be sort of teased out and all the associated dis- symptoms discovered. So, how do we go about helping? Well, we need to make a full medical assessment to get a diagnosis. We need to take a standard history and examination to get that diagnosis. Specifically, we're looking for possible differential diagnoses, i.e. other diagnoses in which pain is present. And, as I said, how do we go about this? We take a thorough history and examination. So, firstly, the standard detailed history. Everything about the pain. What exactly is the patient experiencing? How often and how long has the pain been uh, troubling the patient for? What are the worsening and relieving factors? What's the impact on the activities of everyday life for that particular patient with their pain? Are there any other associated symptoms? Um, how's the patient been dealing with those pains? Are they, have they been sort of taking sort of medication, self-treating? What have they tried? Have they been effective? So that's the history, everything about the pain, all the features. And then on to the examination, according to the symptoms and the history. The reason why we have to be so thorough um, with our history and examination is to look out for red flags, i.e. symptoms and signs that suggest something more sinister occurring. So what are those red flags? Well, for chest pain, uh, we ask the question, is it due to cardiac cause, angina or heart disease? Or... Is it due to a blood clot in the lung, a pulmonary embolism? Or is it due to inflammation around the heart, pericarditis? Headache. Is it sudden onset in nature and associated with neurological symptoms? Neck stiffness. Tenderness of the temporal artery, the artery running down the temporal area. Is it temporal arteritis? Abdominal pain. Is it appendicitis or diverticulitis? Is there unexplained weight loss? All these red flags need to be carefully looked for and excluded. And if there are any of them present, obviously we need to get them, get them further assessed. And that usually means referral onto the hospital to a specialist. Because basically, obviously, say, for example, chest pain, we don't want to miss a heart attack. Even if there are no red flags, but your instinct tells you that something just isn't right, or you yourself as a patient, just don't feel things are right, you must ask. If in doubt, ask. Go to your GP. This is important. So having taken the history and examinations, it's on to investigations. So firstly, the general baseline blood tests, as listed in the NICE guidelines for management of long COVID. So the list starts with a full blood count, kidney function test, liver function test, just standard blood tests that we do in general practice. We also want to do a blood test for inflammatory markers, so C-reactive protein and ferritin. Others on the list are thorough function test and HbA1c, looking for diabetes, probably not really relevant here. 
If the pains are affecting the joints, the other blood test we should be doing is the rheumatoid factor and also the ANA, anti-nuclear antibody and other connective tissue antibody tests needs to be done. And then chest pain, you know, obviously if it's chest pain, we want to exclude that, that, that cardiac cause if it's suspected. So a full cardiovascular workup will be needed and that will, that would have to include a ECG, electrical tracing of the heart, chest x-ray, a BNP, looking for heart failure. If a blood clot is suspected, obviously you're going to be wanting to send blood for a D-dimer um, and obviously for referral, if your suspicions are quite high, then referral to the hospital for a CTPA um, to see if you can visualise any clots on the lungs. And so, having excluded the differential diagnoses and red flags, we're left with the diagnosis of pain due to long COVID. And this is a good point to be at because we have not been what's known as COVID blind. And what do I mean by that? Basically, just because someone uh, has, you know, just because someone's had COVID, it doesn't mean that a new symptom or problem that's popped up can be put down to COVID. It might be due to one of the many other causes for pain, such as heart disease or pulmonary embolism, etc. And that COVID just happens to have occurred at the same time. So, got to be thorough. We mustn't be COVID blind. And so, uh, in long COVID, question, what are the causes for long COVID pain? It's important to know those causes because it helps us understand the problem and hence accept the problem. Also, it also reminds us of the unknowns and complexities of long COVID, all the things that go wrong with long COVID. And hence the reason why fixing it is never going to be possible by doing just one thing. And so, as we know, there are many causes for long COVID. The list is long. There's the damage of the tissues. There's overactive inflammatory system. There's faulty immune system. There's dysfunctional autonomic nervous system. There's disrupted gut friendly bacteria. And I'll cover each briefly, just, just sort of foot to update you and familiarize you and you know reinforce what you already know probably so first of all i said there's damaged tissues so there's direct viral effects causing tissue damage from the initial infection the ace2 receptors on the cells throughout the body sars2 sars cov2 virus locks onto them and it causes cell damage inflammation and often cell death and this leads to general dysfunction and general mischief then there's excessive inflammatory response due to the excessive release of inflammatory factors the cytokines you've all heard of the cytokine storm but also in Part of the excessive inflammatory response, you've got mast cell activation, another part of the excessive inflammatory response. And then there's microclot formation in the blood vessels generally, but including the muscles, the lungs, around the nerves and tissues, but also in the brainstem. Wherever they occur, they cause problems due to blockages in the micro blood vessels that supply those tissues all around the body. And then uh, I mentioned the faulty immune system with the production of autoimmune antibodies, auto antibodies, antibodies that attack our own cells anywhere in the body. And the bad news is there have been in excess of 200 different 
autoantibodies discovered that attack all those different tissues throughout the body. In the joints, leading to inflammatory joint disease like rheumatoid arthritis. In the brain, causing problems with the autonomic control, memory and emotions. And in the gut, causing problems with digestion as well as peristalsis, leading to colicky pains in the abdomen, as well as worsened by the dysbiosis of the long COVID that we find in long COVID. I'm more on that a little, little bit late here. But so basically, autoimmune problems in long COVID are responsible for so many different problems around the body. And then I, I mentioned or reminded you of the dysfunction of the autoimmune nervous system as a result of the excessive inflammatory response, mast cell activation and microclons. There are many effects of the, of the dysfunctional autoimmune, autoimmune nervous system. There are the effects on the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system balance, altering the blood flow through the blood vessels in the brain, causing headache and triggering of migraines. Effects on brainstem leading to sickness behavior response, part of which is part of which is generalized bodily and uh, headache pains. And then there's the effects on the vagus nerve activated in areas of the of inflammation anywhere in the body, sending impulses to the pain center in the brainstem, which triggers pain pathways, which in turn can lead to central pain sensitization, um, a condition although is known as allodynia, um, in which pain is perceived in the presence, of, basically in, in the presence of non-painful stimuli, i.e. stimuli that are not painful, uh, can actually perce be perceived as pain as we see this quite commonly in functional neurological disorder. And then finally, the final effect of the, the COVID, long COVID, is the disturbance and imbalance of the gut microbiota. The gut microbiota, we mean the gut flora, your friendly bacteria lining your gut, replaced by the unfriendly bacteria that causes inflammation in the bowel lumen, in the actual tube of the bowel. Um, a healthy gut flora is generally important for well-being and immune system functioning, as well as normal functioning of the bowel. An unhealthy gut flora will contribute to all the overall excessive inflammatory processes and also interfere with the important gut-brain axis, that interconnection of the gut and the brain, and the brain and the gut, and also cause IBS, irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms, such as those colicky abdominal pains. And so, there it is. Those are the possible causes of long COVID pain. It's complicated, it's very complicated. And one person may have just one of those processes going on at one time, causing their long COVID symptoms and their long COVID pain. But maybe they've got two or three, or maybe all of those processes happening at the same time. That's probably more likely. And so if that's all happening, it's little wonder that long COVID causes so many symptoms in so many systems throughout the body. It's complex. And as I keep saying, um, it's the perfect storm. And it's important to know those causes. Uh, and that's why I've just sort of gone over them again in, you know, not in great detail. But it's important to know them because it helps us and uh, us and you and our patients, helps us understand and hence accept 
long COVID for what it is. So that's the cause is done. Um, but what's more important is what are we going to do about it? Good question. So I'll come on to that in the next part, uh, the, the treatments, the management of long COVID pain. I'll talk about that in part two. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, uh, basically, uh, as I said earlier on at the outset, you know, any advice, adv diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussing with your own GP or qualified health professional. Um, that's the disclaimer bit done. So in the meantime, I wish you well for your long COVID recovery, recovery and cheerio and hopefully see you in, in part two. <laughs>